Hi, this is Lisa Kenny, uh, Executive Director at Gender Spectrum, and I'm really excited today about the event that we have uh, planned and um, with our good friends from the Trevor Project. And so I want to welcome uh, Danielle Orner, who's the Senior Education Manager at the Trevor Project. And Danielle has uh, graciously agreed to meet today uh, and for us to talk a little bit about warning signs and how to help uh, trans and non-binary youth to uh, just become resilient. How do we foster that resilience so that uh, not only are we looking for warning signs and things as, as parents and professionals uh, that we want to be mindful of in helping to support youth, but even beyond that, how do we help prevent that from happening to the degree that we can by supporting them in a lot of other ways that uh, support their resilience. So, Danielle, thank you so much. We couldn't be happier and are so appreciative that you've taken your time today. And of course, thank you so much for the amazing work at the Trevor Project. And uh, we certainly count on you at Gender Spectrum as a partner uh, to provide much, much needed support for families. And so we thank you very much. And thanks for making time today to come and talk with uh, parents and, and professionals about this really important issue. Of course, thank you so much for having me. And just a little background about me. I started as a volunteer at the Trevor Project. And before that, I was a middle school teacher. And before that, I was a resident advisor. But full disclosure, I'm not yet a parent. So I'm sharing this information with you um, from the position of being someone who has been a youth serving professional, but not yet a parent or guardian myself. So I'm gonna go ahead and share the PowerPoint. And Daniel, Daniel, just one quick thing then, I'll remind, I'll let people know too, you're going to go ahead and give your presentation and then at the end I have some questions that uh, mm -hmm. parents have sent in and asked and so I'm going to hold those questions up till the end and then once you're done I will, uh, I'll, we'll have some questions and you and I will just talk for a little bit. Of course, definitely. And my information will be at the end of this PowerPoint as well. So if I don't ask, answer a question uh, through the PowerPoint and there isn't that question that doesn't come up at the end, but folks still want to ask it, they can definitely send me an email and ask that question. I will provide those resources. So uh, today we're going to talk about creating a safe, supportive environment for LGBTQ youth. And we are going to specifically uh, think about gender nonconforming youth, uh, gender fluid youth, uh, trans youth, all of those folks. So uh, just to talk a little bit about where we're going, we're going to talk about Trevor. We're going to talk about the warning signs and how to respond, how to promote resiliency, how to teach self-care and safety planning. And then I've got some resources and then we'll have time for questions. So just a few quick notes on this training. This is only the beginning. We only have about an hour together. So there are definitely gonna be lots of resources and links and other places for you to learn more. So I do encourage you to take a look at those and really explore those resources to continue your education. And also the people in this room or the people viewing this presentation uh, all have different levels of experience and knowledge about today's topics. So for some folks, this may be lived personal experience. For other folks, some of this information may be brand new, and that's okay. We just want to acknowledge that everyone has different levels of knowledge about today's topics. And if you need a break at any point in viewing this, because we'll be talking about some tough stuff, some difficult topics, feel free to take one, uh, pause it, and come back. So a little bit about the Trevor Project. Uh, we are the leading national organization providing crisis intervention and suicide prevention resources for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning youth. And youth we define as being folks who are 25 and under. Of course, if someone is older than 25 and calls our, our hotline or uses one of our resources, they will be directed to a more age appropriate resource as well. So. And of course, uh, parents or guardians or friends who call in to ask for more information about how to support a friend, there will be someone to talk to you as well. So why are we here? Sometimes folks ask, why specifically a youth lifeline? Why specifically an LGBT uh, youth lifeline? Um, so the reason for that is that suicide is the second leading cause of death among young people ages 10 to 24 and accounts for 12% of deaths in that age group every year. 41% of transgender and gender nonconforming people have reported attempting suicide. LGB youth are four times more likely to have attempted suicide than their heterosexual peers. Questioning youth are three times more likely to have attempted suicide than their straight peers. 
And LGB youth who come from highly rejecting families are up to eight times more likely to attempt suicide than LGB youth who come from accepting families. But one supportive person can decrease an LGBTQ youth risk for suicide by 30%. And it's important to acknowledge, and we will talk more about this later in the presentation, but there's nothing inherently about uh, being LGBTQ that makes someone more at risk for mental health or uh, concerns or for suicide, it has a lot more to do with the environment and that hostile environment or not feeling like they can access resources that someone who is a cisgender or straight peer might be able to access those resources. So we'll talk more about that. Like for example, if someone doesn't feel comfortable going into their counselor's office uh, on their high school campus or middle school or elementary campus because they're afraid that their identity is not going to be acknowledged that would be something where that resource is no longer available to them, which is why we see these numbers so much higher. Or things like not seeing themselves in the media or things like hostility in a community or school environment or even unfortunately from family. So what are some of the resources that we have available for youth? We have the Trevor Lifeline and the Trevor Lifeline is the nation's only 24-7 suicide prevention and crisis intervention lifeline for LGBTQ youth. And that's available 24-7 and the number is right there. Of course, if you go to our website, which is the trevorproject.org, the information, the number is there and all the information for all of these services are there. But we also encourage folks to program the number into their phone. Because if you don't have good internet access or maybe your um, student or your youth is just leaving school and only has their phone or you know whatever the situation is, it's a great idea to just program that contact in under the Trevor Project and have that information available. So that's one good protective factor that is easy to do. And then we have Trevor Chat. And Trevor Chat is a free, confidential, secure, instant message service that provides live help with non-suicide related crisis at the trevorchat.org. It's available every day and we have the um, West Coast times there from 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. And so that's pretty much every um, afternoon, evening. So youth can use this resource to talk about all sorts of topics, um, whether it's you know how to come out, whether it's uh, feelings of suicide, whether it's um, talking about what's going on at school, or even you know questions about relationships or where to find other resources. There will be a counselor that can talk to them on Trevor Chat, all about all of those different topics. So that's another great way that youth can have a conversation with someone that they know is going to be a safer space. And then we have Trevor Space, and Trevor Space is a safe, secure social networking site for LGBTQ youth and their allies designed to decrease isolation and promote resiliency. So Trevor Space is really great because it's our only uh, worldwide network and it works a lot like Facebook but it is confidential and secure and uh, we do have folks making sure that all the conversations there are safe and that if anyone needs to reach out and then talk to a volunteer counselor that they will get that message and they will be able to reach out and talk to someone but this is a great way for youth to talk to their other peers about conversations you know like how to ask someone to prom or how to change a policy at school or what to do uh, about coming out or even just sharing like great movies and um, TV shows that they like or books that they like or even having conversations around different coping strategies that work for folks. So this is a great way because we know a lot of times, you know, youth listen to each other sometimes more than they do to their teacher or to someone like a, an adult in that position. So it's a great way for youth to have those conversations with other youth who are going through similar experiences um, and support each other that way. Also, even if youth have a great in-person uh, structure like maybe they're attending their gay straight alliance at school or whatever other um, options are available at school or in their community this is a great one to add on because as we know the holidays are coming up and school's not going to be in session for a lot of folks so they might not be able to access some of those in-person friends so it's great to have multiple places multiple communities where you know youth can access multiple people so it's always good to build up a lot of that uh, a lot of those protective factors so that that, you know if a friend isn't available because they're on vacation or if a teacher or counselor isn't available because it's holiday months or uh, time when school's off they will have someone to reach out to so we want to have lots and lots of people who are there to support our youth 
And then we have a resource that is for everyone, and that's the Trevor Support Center. And the Trevor Support Center is a digital hub with information on a wide range of topics affecting LGBTQ young people. And it can be found at trevorsupportcenter.org, or even if you just go to our website and click on resources, it'll be right there as well. And you can see a little bit on the screenshot there of what is available. There's lots of different topics, including uh, mental health, including resources around self-harm, resources around what to do at school, resources around healthy relationships uh, and safe, safer sex practices, all sorts of things like that that can be found there. And links to all sorts of other organizations that have really good resources and materials. And we also have the Trevor Education Lifeguard Workshop, which is available to anyone at all times online. And it's specifically designed to educate middle school and high school students about self-care, the warning signs of suicide, and how to help a friend in crisis. And what you can find there online is a 16-minute video and lesson plans, as well as a link for how to get resource posters to put in community spaces, libraries, on campuses, and counseling offices, and that just details all of our different resources there, including the Lifeline, Trevor Space, and Trevor Chat, as well as serving as that safer space poster and having that positive message that says you are not alone and it's okay to ask for help. So the reason that uh, it's so important to have this piece of education that can be used in schools or uh, gay straight alliances or whatever other groups are available is that it really does teach youth about how to recognize the warning signs in a friend and what to do when they do recognize those warning signs. So we hear a lot from youth that they are um, trying to help and support a friend that they know is in crisis and they're trying to do that all by themselves. So they're maybe getting that text at three in the morning or maybe they're on Facebook or Tumblr and they're trying to um, support and help and counsel that friend. And so we want to also make sure that those youth are educated about how to identify a supportive adult to talk to and how to identify other resources that they can recommend to their friend to make sure that their friend is able to get that help and support. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later on in the presentation and what's involved in that lifeguard workshop and really how to get more and more and more people who know your um, child, who know your youth, how to get them educated about suicide prevention as well. So one of the things that we always talk about when we're talking about um, LGBTQ youth and mental health, there is kind of a double stigma that the youth are facing because there's, you know, there can be stigma depending on the community and environment around uh, the identity of the youth, um, their LGBT identity, and there can also be a lot of stigma around mental health in general. A lot of things that people feel uncomfortable about talking about. Maybe students have never had any kind of mental health education at school. Um, you know, and people can feel really uncomfortable talking about needing help or asking for help or what to do if someone asks for help from them. So it's a really good way to open up both of those conversations in a classroom space or a community setting to make sure that we're having conversations not only about LGBTQ identity, but also about mental health and that it's okay to ask for help and it's okay to have these conversations and that we as an adult are a safer person to talk to and that we are comfortable having conversations about mental health. And we'll talk more about how to do that. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what the warning signs are and how to respond. Some other organizations, oh, well, first we'll talk about our thoughts. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so I've got seven statements here and you can see at the top of the slide, there's a little uh, A and a D and a little line between, and you can do this activity mentally or you can grab a piece of paper and jot it down as well. So the A would be agree and the D would be disagree. And we have a little line in between. So the middle would be neutral or not sure, I don't know. And you can go ahead and go through each of these statements and kind of plot yourself where you think you might be, whether you agree with the statement fully, or maybe you're more towards the middle, a little unsure, or you disagree with the statement. So the first one is, anyone can be at risk for suicide. The second one is, most suicides are caused by a single traumatic event. And you're thinking, do I agree? Do I disagree? Uh, what do I think about that statement? Three, most suicides occur with little or no warning. Four, people who talk about suicide won't do it. Five, people who are serious about killing themselves are beyond help. Six, 
it can be dangerous to talk to someone directly about suicide. And seven, I feel equipped to talk about someone's suicidal thoughts. So we're going to go through each one, starting at the bottom and going back up. So we'll just take a moment to think about what are some of the feelings that come up for you when you think about talking to someone who is thinking about suicide? And specifically, what are some of the feelings that come up for you when thinking about talking to your child or to one of your, ch child's friend, one of your children's friends about uh, suicide or about this topic, about mental health? So a lot of the feelings that come up for folks is being really afraid, being scared about what it means, being scared about saying the wrong thing, being scared about not having the resources or help you know, to cope with what's going on, being scared about not knowing how serious the situation is or what, you know, whether or not they should take this statement seriously, what's normal, what's abnormal, you know, all of those different feelings come up, as well as feelings about being scared of, you know, hey, is it my fault? Is it something that I've done? Is it, um, you know, all of those feelings of shame around mental health. And because in our society, we don't talk a lot about mental health, there can be a lot of those feelings of, you know, because my family is going through this or because someone in my family is going through this, that it's, um, you know, somehow my, something, something that I should be ashamed of or something that is wrong or broken or, you know, that there's blame involved there. So a lot of those feelings come up uh, for folks. So let's just think about what some of the warning signs for suicide are. And I've also heard lots of organizations beginning to call them invitations to help. And I really like using invitations to help because that reminds us that even if one or two of these signs are present, it's an invitation to have a conversation. It's an invitation to see what can be done. So, um, you know, warning signs can sometimes be a little like, ah, panic, like this is a warning sign and I'm seeing it, now what do I do? But invitations to help reminds us like, let's stop, let's pause, let's have a conversation. It may or may not be an indication of someone thinking about suicide, but it's definitely something we wanna talk about because there is some struggle going on there. There is some uh, mental health concerns sort of going on there. So the first one is having a plan for suicide and a means to carry it out. So if someone is saying where, how, when, and whether or not that's in a 24 to 48 hour window, that's an important um, warning sign that we want to look at. So a lot of times when we talk to youth, uh, especially when I've gone into middle school or high school or even college classrooms, a lot of times youth believe that they shouldn't talk to someone directly about suicide. They're concerned that having that conversation will either offend the person or will put the thought in their head or will imply to the person that they should be thinking about suicide. Sometimes, you know, youth will say, well, what if I say that and it makes it sound like that you know, their life is so bad that they should be thinking about it. But we do, in fact, want to talk directly about suicide and directly about our uh, concerns because we need to know what risk level the person is at. We need to know whether or not they have a plan, um, whether or not they have a means to carry it out, and whether or not they're thinking about doing it within the window of 24 to 48 hours, because that's going to change how um, the teacher or counselor or parent or even friend responds to that. So um, different ways that folks express those suicidal feelings or feelings of hopeless. They can be online or offline. They can be direct or indirect. So something that would be an offline or, you know, in the real space, uh, kind of thing that is direct is someone saying, I want to kill myself or I want to die. That would be a direct statement that is happening in real space. But sometimes folks might be posting something on Facebook or Tumblr or Twitter, and it might be indirect. It might be, um, I just want to sleep forever. The world, everyone in the world would be so much better off without me. I'm such a burden to my friends and to my family. They're, they're so tired of hearing about what's going on with me and I'm a burden and it would just be easier if I weren't around. So those are things that we still want to have a conversation about because that's an indirect online expression. Of course, too, sometimes youth will have multiple social media channels. So they may have a Facebook that's for friends or for family and for, um, you know, adults in their life. And then they might have another one that's just for 
youth or is just for their peers or just their close friend group. So that's why it's really important to make sure that everyone in our um, youth lives knows about what to do if they see this message because it may be a message that's posted on their private Facebook that as a parent you don't have access to um, or it may be something that they talk to a teacher or counselor about. So being aware that those um, feelings of hopelessness or expressing feelings of hopelessness are still things that we want to take seriously and have a conversation about and to ask directly, are you thinking about killing yourself? So other things that can be invitations to help are signs of depression. So folks feeling empty or sad or numb or hopeless for more a period of more than two weeks and sometimes without really being able to identify necessarily why. Uh, changes in regular behavior. So this can be tough because uh, adolescents are going through changes in their regular behavior. But the things we're specifically looking for are things like having trouble sleeping, having uh, no longer taking any kind of you know pride in appearance, you know uh, hygiene kind of going by the wayside, or you know other changes in regular behavior, things that they used to enjoy they don't enjoy anymore. Um, not showing up for stuff that used to be really important for them. So those would be things that would be specifically changes in regular behavior that we would want to look at. Um, a preoccupation or talking a lot about death can also be uh, something that would be an invitation to have a conversation. Um, of course, also that can be something that youth or especially young children are, might be going through that time in their life where they're thinking about, you know, death and what it means to be human and mortal. So again, these are things that are invitations to have conversations and one item by itself might not necessarily be um, a sign of suicide or of thinking about suicide, but it's definitely a place to have a conversation. It's definitely a place to um, provide some help and, and talk about, oh, if, if you are thinking about killing yourself, here are some of the things that we can do. Uh, alcohol or drug use increasing or any kind of risk-taking behavior increasing. This can be particularly hard for LGBTQ youth because there might not be a lot of information about safer sex practices that is being provided in school. So if they are of middle school and high school age, you know, talking about risk, um, risky behaviors and how to have safer behaviors is also a place where there's an invitation to have a conversation, an invitation to help. And of course, increased isolation or withdrawal. So no longer spending time with people they used to spend time with or enjoy spending time with, withdrawing from activities, withdrawing um, in general from, you know, from school or from any of those things and, and not wanting to have conversations. So, a risk factor is a trait, attribute, or characteristic that is associated with suicidality. So a chronic risk factor is something that increases over one's lifetime. So something like an undiagnosed uh, mental health concern can be a chronic risk factor. And then acute risk factors are associated with greater risk in the near, time, near, near term, and those can sometimes be called warning signs. So we're going to talk a little bit about general risk factors and specifically ones that apply to LGBTQ youth. So um, for all folks, um, different risk factors include mental health. So what's going on in the emotional realm? What's going on in the psychological state? And is there chronic issues, chronic pain that hasn't been addressed, that's been building over a lifetime? Uh, also experience, uh, experiences include things like accessibility to firearms, homelessness, family crisis, academic pressure, non-suicidal self-injury, loss of a loved one, risky sexual behavior, victimization, or history of suicide in the family. So the ones that specifically affect LGBTQ youth are things like emotional state. So we know that the hardest times for LGBTQ youth or the times that they're most vulnerable to crisis is right before, right during, and right after that first initial coming out process, which can be difficult because sometimes nobody knows what's going on because there hasn't really been that full coming out process. But that's a time when the emotional state can be fluctuating because um, during that first coming out process, 
folks don't know what's going to happen or youth don't know what's going to happen. They don't know if they're going to lose friends. They don't know if they're going to be no longer accepted in a faith-based community or other community organizations in athletics, how family is going to respond, not just how parents or guardians are going to respond, but you know, how are grandma and grandpa going to respond or aunts or uncles or cousins or siblings going to respond. So there's a lot of questions about what the future looks like and how safe that future will be. And then of course, right after that first initial coming out process, there is that uh, time of dealing with what has happened um, and maybe some unexpected consequences that have come up. So of course we know that folks have to come out for their entire lifetime. So every time they go to any school, every time they meet somebody new, every time, you know, there's all these different layers. And so of course it isn't just a, the one time event, but particularly around those, that early time, we wanna make sure that we're um, having conversations and looking for those signs of crisis. Homelessness is a big risk factor for youth because unfortunately a lot of youth are uh, told to leave their homes when they come out. And then of course family crisis, um, parents or guardians or siblings not agreeing on you know uh, how to accept the youth or how to treat the youth after that information about um, them coming out. Um, different people in the youth life rejecting them, whether it's a sibling or a grandparent or an aunt or uncle or cousin or whoever it may be, um, those elements can also be risk factors. Academic pressure, so school becoming an unsafe space or worrying about whether or not they're going to be able to uh, continue to achieve their dreams at school or achieve their different goals. Loss of loved ones, so that can be people who leave their lives uh, because for you know, various reasons, or even losing members of their community to suicide. So that can be something that can increase risk as well. Whether it's a celebrity or uh, a YouTube um, influencer or someone that they knew online, uh, that can affect the entire community or even media coverage around an LGBT youth uh, death by suicide can also put someone in a more vulnerable space. Uh, risky sexual behavior can also um, increase a youth risk because if they don't have access to ha safer sex practices, then that can put them at a, a risk for different health concerns as well. And then victimization, so harassment at school, harassment in the community, um, or even just being especially lately, um, being exposed to harassment in the community, harassment on, uh, in, in the news, um, on media, constant conversation and negative response around things like the ba bathroom issues or around laws, around all of these different things. So constantly hearing negative um, opinions of who you are and your identity being expressed by uh, figures in the media. So some specific risk factors also include when it comes to youth who are gender fluid, youth who are gender nonconforming, um, there can be specific risk factors like deciding how to get dressed in the morning, deciding what to wear in the morning, deciding how to present at school, um, and worrying about the safety involved there can all be specific risk factors. Um, concerns about not having access to clinically competent care, uh, concerns about what things will look like in the future, all of those things can be risk factors. And of course, coming out, rejection when coming out, and coming out at a young age can also have a unique set of risk factors, often because um, generally elementary school teachers, elementary school counselors, not all of them, but generally there's a lot of focus on middle school and high school and providing information to those staff members. And sometimes folks who are in elementary school or in that staff don't have as much information about youth who are coming out at that age or don't have as much access to things like what kind of curriculum to bring in. So we will talk a lot more about resources that we can bring in so that we can uh, neutralize some of those risk factors. And uh, of course, LGBTQ related victimization, things like uh, not being accepted at school, things being harassed at school, being harassed on the street, all of that sort of thing. And then unique developmental stressors. So, so much of our young adult lives are very gendered. Um, right from the beginning, but of course in middle school and high school and those kind of coming of age times, there's also the unique developmental stressors of 
these coming of age events like prom, like quinceaneras, like bar mitzvahs, like all of those different um, kind of rituals, depending on your culture and community that folks go through. And for gender nonconforming youth, there's a lot of questions about, will I be able to participate? What will my participation look like? So um, a lot of schools, I've been able to talk to schools that have great policies and they have a committee and they have an LGBT liaison and they have all sorts of great resources. And then the youth will come to them and say, but you haven't rewritten the prom policy. The prom dress code policy is still very gendered. So um, being aware of things like that, that uh, can affect youth as well. So let's talk about what to do. So when you do have that, after that invitation to help, after that warning sign, or if someone comes to you, if a youth comes to you, um, or if your child comes to you, the first thing that you wanna do is listen, validate, and acknowledge. I hear what you're saying. I hear that you just can't take it anymore because of some of that fear and that um, care and concern for the people in our lives sometimes the first thing we want to do is say no you don't really feel that way or it's not that bad or you know in in some way to kind of shut the conversation down from that place of concern and because of you know from that place of fear um, and not to, to create that space for the youth to have the conversation. So even though it can be really hard, we really do want to listen, listen, validate, and acknowledge, and not come right in with, it's going to get better, you don't have to feel this way, I love you, I would be so sad if anything happened to you. We really want to allow them to tell us how they're feeling and to have that conversation. So that's the first step. And then we want to ask about those suicide um, or about our concerns directly. Uh, we really want to use the question, with all that's going on, have you been thinking about killing yourself? So sometimes because of that fear or because of stigma um, around mental health or around suicide, folks will sometimes ask a question that is close to that, but kind of dodging the actual core of the issue. So they might ask something like, uh, with all that's going, you know, with all that's going on, um, do you, are you feeling like you have no future? Or are you feeling like um, you just don't want to be here anymore? Well, that's, that's a different question. We really want to ask very specifically to make sure that we're on the same page and we're understanding what the conversation is about. Also, when you ask, you know, have you been thinking about killing yourself? That can actually take the burden off of the youth from having to bring that up. So you're showing that you're okay having that conversation. You're not scared of having that conversation. You're comfortable having that conversation. Um, and it's something that you can talk about because it can be really scary to think about coming to someone and saying, you know, I'm thinking about killing myself. So you want to, in some ways, take that burden off of them so that you can have that conversation. And they may say, no, it's not really like that. I'm more just really sad about the future and I don't know where to go from here and I'm tired you know and so that that's okay we now we understand more of what that feeling is we don't want to make assumptions and we don't want to use kind of you know more fuzzy language that might not give us an accurate assessment of what's what's happening um, let's go to the next one and then then you want to express your concern uh, we're going to get through this um, we're going to find ways to, to talk more about this. I'm here to support you. I know other places that we can reach out to and talk to. This is a good place to express your concern. Oh, I remember what I was going to say about asking about suicide concerns directly. When you ask the question, have you been thinking about killing yourself? If someone does say no, uh, it's important not to react with, with relief. You know, you don't want to go, oh, thank God. I, I don't know what I would have said if you were. I'm so glad that you're not. And the reason that you don't want to um, react that way is that it might be that the youth is thinking about killing themselves and they just don't feel comfortable talking about it yet, or they're just afraid how you're going to react. And so they kind of gave a more neutral answer. Or it may even be that they're not thinking about it now, but maybe two months from now or next year, they will be thinking about it. So you don't want to give them the feeling that saying no is the right answer. So a good response if you say, 
or have you been thinking about killing yourself? And they say, no, I'm just, you know, stressed about the future and I'm not sure where to go from here. Um, a good response to that will say, okay, well, just, you know, we can always have that conversation and I'm, I'm always here for you. We can always talk about, you know, what's going on with you and what's going on with your with mental health. So tell me more about, you know, your thoughts about the future. So we don't want to respond with kind of like, oh, thank God, you know, or in some way imply that the right answer is no. So after you've expressed your concern, you want to keep the questions open-ended and non-assumptive and really um, help them have the space to share what's going on with them. Uh, how would you describe your depression? How would you describe what's going, what's going on? We really want to provide a non-judgmental space for them to share exactly what they're feeling so that we know more about the situation and we're not putting our own interpretation of what's going on with them onto it. And allow them to guide the conversation, allow them to have that space and share all those feelings. Um, you can even say things like, I'm just here to listen, you know, what do you wanna talk about today? Um, or what do you, how do you feel about that? Or what do you think would be a good solution? to those feelings and really allow them to talk about what some of the things are that they're thinking of in terms of, you know, solutions or coping mechanisms or what they want or how they would like the future to look. So of course this conversation takes a lot longer than saying something like, it's gonna be okay, we're gonna get through this right at the beginning and then just kind of, you know, avoiding the conversation. So you know, this is something that we do want to take time with that will take a long time to have the conversation. And it's something that if someone says, no, I'm not really thinking about it, or they say, I am thinking about it, but I don't really have a plan, or I don't know what I would do. It's something that we definitely want to check back in on, you know, and say, hey, this has been a great conversation. Do you want to talk about it again on Friday? Or hey, let's like set aside some time to just you and me be able to have this conversation. So that we don't just kind of leave it without any follow-up. So the way that we teach this to youth through the Lifeguard Workshop is we have the You Care acronym, and we remind them um, that you are never alone, you are not responsible for anyone who chooses to take their own life. As a friend, family, or loved one, all you can do is listen and support and assist the person in getting the help that, that they need. Um, a lot of times youth, uh, if they do have those you know, strong support groups with other peers, they may lose a friend to suicide. So we wanna make sure that when we do train them about suicide prevention, that they don't feel like it's their responsibility or that if they offer a resource and then that resource, you know, turns out not to work or the youth does take their life anyway, that it's not uh, their fault. So you wanna connect the person to resources and to a supported, a trusted adult. So we really train youth to make sure that they don't keep it a secret, that they involve as a supported, trusted adult and kind of start building that network of people who know. Um, it's really important to make sure that lots of people are trained, that lots of people are there to support the youth, as many as possible. Uh, accept and listen to the person's feelings and take them seriously. A lot of times youth will tell us, oh, well, someone told me this, but I just thought they were doing it for attention or I just, I didn't think they really meant it or they were exaggerating. So it is important to always take statements seriously. Um, and what we teach youth is we always say like, the worst that can happen is someone can say, no, that's not the way I'm feeling at all. You say, okay, well, I really care about mental health and making sure there's not a stigma on mental health, so I'm always open to having those conversations. So we really want to role model that, that it's okay to talk about mental health. It's okay to talk about feelings of suicide. And then respond if the person has a plan to attempt suicide and tell someone you trust to reach out and get resources that are needed. And empower the person to get help and to call the Trevor Lifeline or any other support system that, you know, that they, that they feel comfortable um, working with. If they'd rather call the National Lifeline or they have, you know, somewhere else that they'd like to call or they'd like to call their clinician or therapist or whatnot, empower them to reach out and get those resources. And of course, the Trevor Project is here 24 seven. So when we talk about having that conversation, um, some of the things that uh, we sometimes know but forget to practice are things like empathetic li listening. So reflecting the person's language, reflecting your child's language and asking for clarification. We try not to assume that we understand a term or understand what's, uh, what everything that's being said. So it's okay to say, hey, you said you're feeling depressed. Like, what does that mean for you? What, what does that look like for you? Because we may have a very different 
definition of depression than they do. Or they may be using language that they've learned that we don't know yet. So it's okay to say, you know, um, what do you mean by the gender binary? What do you mean by gender fluid? What do you mean by pansexual? What do you mean by these terms? And, and ask for that clarification. Let the youth be the expert on their experience and what they're going through. And then validate feelings. Um, be sensitive to the emotions being expressed and normal, normalize those experiences. Um, it's important to validate the feelings of depression. And it can be really invalidating to say things like, It'll, you know, it, it'll get better. Don't feel that way. You know, validate and, and be there with them in those feelings. And it can be really hard because it, it can be really scary to validate the pain and suffering that someone's going through, especially a loved one, especially uh, a young person. And express care and concern and encouragement. Express that you do care about them, that you are there for them, that you want to support them, and that you want to help them. Um, enact any of the of the plans and solutions they may have. You know, hey, what can we do about that? How can we how can we work on that plan? How can we work on some of your ideas um, for making your space a better place? And stay present. You know, be careful not to interrupt. Be careful not to you know change the subject or you know be doing other things or um, anything like that. Um, and if it's a conversation that starts in a space that, you know, a car ride right before you drop your um, child off for school or something like that, and it does have a limited time period, you know, say, hey, let's, let's continue this conversation later. Let's, you know, when can we keep talking about this? Um, and be non-judgmental, be a sounding board. That can be really challenging to hear what someone's saying and what they're going through and how they're interpreting their experience. And you may have a feeling of like, oh, I know better or I know differently or, but you know, to really create that space um, during the conversation to really listen to what, what's being expressed and kind of take that non-judgmental place. And then give those little minimal encouragers invitations to say more, um, you know, say more about what's going on there, say more about what that experience is like. So some of the ways that you can, oh, um, but before we talk about some of the ways that you can give those minimal encouragers, we have a list of great questions um, that you can ask. There are a few things that we do want to be careful of. We do want to be careful of avoidance. Um, because of that stigma around mental health, because of a lot of the fear around mental health, we want to be careful that we're not avoiding tough emotions, uh, painful emotions uh, that are being expressed. And we don't want to change the subject. And we also don't want to go into that place of interrogating because of fear, like, you know, rapid fire questioning about, you know, what's going on here? What do you mean that? What do you mean by, you know, allowing that space, allowing sometimes silence um, for someone else to gather their thoughts. And be careful of, of lecturing or advice giving, you know, um, things like, oh, I once was experiencing depression and what I did was this and it worked for me and I uh, swear it will work for you. So be careful of not jumping in and, and being in kind of that fix it mode. Um, a lot of times we do want to be in that fix it mode for people we love. We're like, okay, I hear your problem and here are the things that I'm going to do to make it better because I don't want you to be in pain anymore and I don't want you to suffer. So I'm going to, you know, jump right in there and fix it. Um, but that can sometimes be serve as a way to, to, of shutting people down and people can start to feel like, oh, um, I'm not having the space to express what I, what I want or need. Um, and we've all had experiences like that before where we've come to someone and we're trying to share a difficult conversation or a difficult topic with them and they jump in immediately and say, oh, I know what you need to do. I get your problem 100%. You just need to do this, this, and this. Um, so that's a good thing to keep in, in mind. Uh, also, bright sighting, you know, being like, it's going to get better. It's going to get better no matter what. The analogy I use for this is if someone comes to us and they have a broken arm, we don't say, oh, I once had a broken arm and it'll heal. Don't worry. All it takes is time. I mean, certainly not. We wouldn't do that. We want to definitely address the pain that is happening right now. And even though it will take time for the broken arm to heal, we're definitely going to do some things to um, take care of that broken arm in the present moment. So we want to do the same thing with anything that's related to mental health. We want to say, what can we do now to start alleviating some of that pain, to start facilitating some of that healing, and not just put it off to some, some you know, future time. 
Um, and sometimes, you know, a lot of times we'll hear from teachers, especially that the, they'll be telling youth like, oh, well, don't worry, it, you know, things will be better in college. And then the youth gets to college and maybe things aren't better for whatever reason. We don't want to put feeling good off in some distant future. We want to do things now. Um, invalidating or trying to change their mind. So we don't want to invalidate someone by not taking them seriously. We don't want to invalidate them by saying you can't do that because indeed people can. Um, so we don't want to say, oh, you can't do that or that's not an option because it is, it is an option. And we don't want to try and change their mind. We want to have that conversation and not immediately go into, um, you can't do that, that's a bad idea. There's, this is not what you want to do. Um, we want to allow to start having a conversation about how to uh, safety plan and have coping mechanisms and what can we do instead of immediately trying to come in and, and change somebody's mind about how they feel. So youth are the experts on their own lives. They're the experts on their own experience. Nobody, no matter how well they know them, uh, is with them all of the time and experiencing the world as they experience it. And we can't be completely in their heads and experience their thoughts and emotions the way that they do. So they are the experts and we do need to allow them the space to uh, share what they know with us. So if they're the experts, what do we offer? We offer that support. We offer that community, we offer them resources, we offer them education. So it is okay for us to say, if a youth says, I don't know what to do about this, or I don't know how I'm feeling about this, it's okay to offer some education, some resources, some places to connect. Uh, so just because folks aren't offering advice doesn't mean that we don't offer them support and different resources to help them. So when we're having a conversation, directive versus open questioning. So a directive question is something that we want to avoid, something like, you don't, want, you don't want to do that, do you? So that already kind of has some implied opinion of what the right choice is. A more open question that allows someone to truly share what's going on with them would be something like, what do you want to do? Or what do you want? Um, something like, you're really lonely, aren't you? Um, could be better, because then they're going to say yes, no, you know, it kind of gives them just the yes or no answer. You want to really open up that space and say, it sounds like you're feeling lonely. Is that how you're feeling? Or you sound lonely. So then you're checking in. And they may say, no, it's not really lonely. It's more of isolated. I feel isolated and shut out. Now that's a different feeling and we want to be able to explore, you know, why, it's, why what's going on there. Um, so a, another directive question would be, why do you want to do that? Again, there's a kind of implied um, judgment there. Uh, a better question might be, help me understand why you're doing that. Can really open up space. Help me understand um, that choice. Um, a directive statement would be something like, you might start a fight if you challenge him. A more open-ended question is, what do you think will happen if you challenge him? Or what do you think it will happen if you come up to that friend? Or what do you think will happen if you have that conversation with your teacher? So really allowing youth to explore options because we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen if they go in and talk to their teacher. We don't know what's going to happen if they have a conversation with their friends. So we want them to be able to explore what are the possible options and what will I do if it, go, if it doesn't go the way that I hope that it will. So we don't want to say something like, oh, I'm sure if you talk to your friend, and they'll be open and welcome and supportive of you because a friend might not be and we want to make sure we have that conversation with um, youth about what will you do what, what will you do if that doesn't go well or if that doesn't happen the way that, that you're hoping it will so that they're prepared for that and they can think about um, safety planning and coping mechanisms that they'll have around that uh, another directive statement would be if my boyfriend were doing that I'd want him to stop instead you can say what do you want him to do or something like, uh, we don't want to make a statement of, oh, if my friends were treating me that way, I wouldn't want to be friends with them anymore. Well, what do you want your friends to be like? So really allowing a youth to explore what they want in their life, what they're hoping the future will look like, what they're working towards. So there are some myths about LGBTQ youth out there. And one of the big ones is that LGBTQ youth have a predisposition for mental illness. And we spoke a little bit about this in the beginning when we were talking about statistics, but the reality is that LGBTQ youth mental health status is diverse as the youth themselves. It's unwelcoming and hostile environments and attitudes towards LGBTQ identities that can contribute to negative mental health outcomes. 
Additionally, the stigma in society is commonly internalized by stigmatized groups themselves, which may manifest in the symptoms of mental illness. Uh, again, going back to the example of someone who is a cisgender straight youth might feel comfortable going in and talking to their English teacher or to their counselor about what's going on with them, whereas um, a gender diverse youth might not feel like they're safe going in and talking to a counselor or going to go talk to a youth group leader or a coach. So a lot of times those channels that are already there, those networks of social support, they're kind of you know, shut down or potentially could be shut down where there might be fear about how is that person going to react. So even if that person is supportive, the youth might not know that. And it's gonna take a whole lot more courage and a whole lot more risk to step over that threshold into that person's office. So that's um, a good way of looking at it. Another way that we can go ahead and take a look at that is someone who has low vulnerability, somebody who is generally um, accepted by society, approved of by society, uh, joins a sports team, doing pretty good at school, you know, has those support systems in place, they're still gonna have highs and lows and things that go on. They're still gonna have all sorts of stuff going on that you know young adults have going on. So they may fail a test, they may break up with a, uh, um, you know, someone that they've been dating or seeing, they might have a fight with a friend, they might not do as well um, on a sports team as they anticipated, or they might have something happening at home, family crisis or something going on um, in their community. And then when something really, stressful happens, uh, the death of a loved one, or maybe that breakup, or something like that happens, it doesn't push them over the line of crisis because they already have low vulnerability. So they're already down on that um, lower wavelength. But somebody who is dealing with, you know, harassment at school, someone who's dealing with, you know, not being able to have a conversation with a family member anymore because they've been rejected, or all sorts of other things. And then something big happens, like a breakup like losing a friend, like um, you know, any of those major life events, it might push them to that, over that line of crisis because they already have that high vulnerability. So another way I've heard it described is um, when it comes to, as an example, like having cancer cells in the body. We all have cancer cells in the body, but because of antioxidants and all of these other protective factors, those cells get neutralized and never develop into cancer. So it's the same kind of thing with mental health. We want to create a lot of protective factors to neutralize or outweigh a lot of those vulnerability factors or those risk factors. So the more that we put you know, into the youth life or the more that the youth has access to, the better. Um, another myth is that LGBTQ youth attempt suicide because of bullying in schools. And the reality is that suicide is a complex issue and cannot be distilled into a simple casual relationship with bullying. Bullying does contribute to a negative environment for all youth and in turn can be a triggering event or chronic issue for LGBTQ youth. But many issues, including bullying and existing mental health conditions, can serve as contributing factors for an LGBTQ suicide. So this is important because a lot of times schools will only want to have a bullying policy in place or um, they think that you know, as long as the bullying policy is in place or as long as there's not any incidents of harassment being reported, then youth are fine. But we still need to have a conversation about mental health and we still need to be representing LGBTQ um, community and identity and uh, historical figures and people you know, in a celebratory way throughout the community and throughout the school and not just having just a conversation about LGBTQ youth and mental health and suicide risk. Um, so it's definitely something that we want to keep looking at as a complex issue that doesn't just have one solution. So what do we do to promote resiliency? So how do we um, really add all of those perfect protective factors into the environment? So some of the general protective factors for um, all folks is having easy access to culturally competent and effective clinical care, being able to identify um, those practitioners and um, access them is a big piece in protective care. So whether it's a family therapist or um, any other kind of clinical care, that being supported by someone who understands your identity is big. Uh, restricted access to highly lethal means of suicide is a big one, making sure that folks don't have access to firearms. Uh, having strong connections, so anywhere that those strong connections can be fostered, school, um, 
friend groups, online, online communities, in-person communities, faith-based communities, wherever the strong connections can happen uh, is great. And then, of course, remembering that LGBTQ youth uh, have all of these other aspects of their identity as well. And oftentimes they can be kind of just, you know, dwindled down to that one element of their um, identity. So we want to make sure that we keep nurturing all these other elements of their identity and um, helping them see themselves as a full person. So having, you know, things like artistic or athletic or academic talent, nurtured, acknowledged, recognized are all great. So those are protective factors too. You know, and maybe if school is not a safe place or you're know, having trouble with um, school policies and things like that, another great thing while working on those school policies is to maybe in enroll your um, youth in an art class off campus or um, in an athletic team or in an event or group off campus or in, through another organization or even online so as to continue to promote those elements of their life and identity. And talking about skills and problem solving, we don't offer youth in schools a lot of basic relationship and skills in problem solving. So any conversations around that is good as well. So making sure that youth um, can think through, okay, what will happen if I do this and what will happen if I do that and what are possible solutions in their personal lives, it can be a great protective factor. Some specific LGBTQ protective factors are having those support systems in place, uh, family support systems, community support systems, school support, accessing PFLAG, accessing GLSEN to be able to have those lessons being taught in schools, um, using all of you know, those great policies and trying to get them passed in your school communities is, can all be great. Uh, finding you know, faith-based or um, other community support in your community can also be great as well. Uh, positive media representations, or another way of thinking about it can be calling it possibility models. So doing things like seeking out um, movies about youth or about um, LGBTQ identity, and or even books, picture books, YA books, we have some resources at the end about this, and sharing those with your child, like um, looking at those possibility models for what the future might look like or what success might look like or, um, you know, seeing other youth or other um, celebrities or other figures who are, or even scientists and historians and all those sorts of things where folks are living their authentic truth and living the life that they want to live can be great. Um, we see so many youth who are so inspired by YouTube influencers and um, watching all of the videos and connecting with people like that. So even looking to social media for various possibility models where you can take a look at that positive media representation. Uh, also LGBTQ and LGBTQ friendly social and support networks. Um, GLBTnearme.org is a search engine that will allow you to find what is in your area. Um, under various categories, uh, whether it's that uh, culturally competent clinical care, whether it's culturally competent uh, therapists, other things like that are listed, faith-based groups are listed, um, college groups are listed, all sorts of different groups, PFLAG are listed on that search engine. And then development of coping mechanisms, safety planning and self-care. And that's the next place that we're gonna go into is talking more about what that means to have safety planning and self-care. Um, but just a few specific things for supporting uh, trans and gender nonconforming youth, you know, always being aware of using that non-assumptive language, using the preferred name and gender pronouns, um, and asking about, you know, uh, what the preferred name and gender pronouns are, and educating other folks in the community or who interact with the youth on how to, um, or what those uh, preferred pronouns and uh, preferred name is. Also, uh, youth may be saying, and we've heard youth say before, they don't like the preferred being at the front because that kind of implies like, oh, I you know, would prefer to have a Diet Coke, but I'll drink a Pepsi. It's, and it, it kind of can uh, make it seem not as uh, essential. So even just saying name and gender pronouns, uh, what, is, 
you know, the name and gender pronouns that we use. Um, not making assumptions about a person's gender or the gender of partners or family members or friends. So that can be really supportive as well, like not only when talking about your youth, but also about all people, not making any assumptions about other people's gender, not making assumptions about their um, orientation, not making assumptions about the gender of their partner. Because it can be really invalidating if you're very supportive of um, one person, but then make comments about other people in passing about, you know, what their gender identity is or making guesses or making that sort of thing. So, you know, having that non-assumptive language apply to everyone. Uh, exploring gender identity, demonstrating a non-judgmental attitude, and providing a safe space to explore gender issues, and really meeting the person where they're at. Uh, and how they understand things. Again, letting the youth be the expert on their life, hearing what they have to say. A lot of times, too, uh, youth are um, able to access so much information from other people now, you know, through the internet, through these social media groups, through all this, all these different places where, you know, people are blogging and sharing information that, frankly, I didn't have access to when I was younger. And so they are going to have so much more information um, I always, you know, like to think that LGBTQ today are like getting a PhD in gender and sexuality um, by the time they're in middle school. And so, you know, allowing them to be the expert and allowing them to share. And, you know, sometimes somebody's terms are going to change. Sometimes someone's pronouns are going to change. And that doesn't mean that they're going through a phase and it doesn't mean that they don't know who they are. It might just mean that they have more access to information or they have, they found a term that um, feels like it fits them better. So kind of being, allowing that journey to take place and allowing for the youth to, to provide new information. And also a, a thing to promote resiliency is it's never our place to tell a young person when, whether, where, or how to come out. Um, it's never our place to tell them, you know, come out at school, you'll feel better, or tell this person because they're coming for the holidays. It's up to them how and when they come out, even if they've done that initial coming out process, it's still their choice when and where and how they tell people. And so always respecting that confidentiality and asking their permission before letting anyone know. And they'd be like, yeah, sure, have that conversation with grandma, or yeah, sure, you know, have that conversation with my teacher. Or they may say, no, I want to do that, or I don't want them to know. And that's okay, it's not our place to tell them when and where and how to do that. So teaching self-care. When we talk about self-care, when we talk about um, safety planning, here's some of the things that we want to think about. So what are some of the things that you like to do to take care of yourself? You know, and which activities work best in different situations? At school, on the weekends, when you're alone, as a family, et cetera. So a lot of times what we find, even as um, you know, caregiving professionals or mental health um, professionals, we don't demonstrate self-care. We don't do those things to take care of ourselves that we know that we should. So that's a big one, demonstrating that self-care, demonstrating you know, whatever it is that you like to do to take care of yourself, taking that time to take care of yourself can be really big. Um, and also talking about what you can do in different situations. So sometimes when we see posts about self-care, like a magazine article about self-care, you know, it's things like cuddle a puppy and take a bubble bath and eat some chocolate. Well, you can't exactly take a bubble bath if you're stressed out in the middle of third period. Like that's not a self-care plan that's gonna work for that situation. And um, some people don't have access to cuddling puppies and some people don't like cuddling puppies and you know, maybe chocolate's not the self-care thing for them. So we wanna make sure that a self-care plan that we go through with our youth is about what they like, what makes them feel better, and that it's a multi-leveled and layered plan so that there's different activities that they can do at different times of the day. So if it's 3 a.m. in the morning and they're feeling stressed, what's something that they can do? Draw, watch Netflix, um, you know, re-watch some YouTube videos, but maybe not, you know, call a friend or go for a run because can't really call a friend at 3 a.m. <laughs> you do text each other at 3 a.m. But, you know, that might not be the best plan. Or going for a run, well, that might, might not be something that you want to do at 3 a.m. So we really want to talk about what can you do at different times when you're feeling different emotions. So a good way to do this, and we do have all of this information on our Pinterest board. So if you want to print out any of these or access any of these, um, I'll show you where to find them later. 
so there's a self-care wheel where we talk about all the different layers of who we are as a person and what we can do in each of those spaces to um, take care of ourselves. So for youth, their profession would be student. So they would fill in information about what they can do when they're at school, if they're feeling anxiety, if they're feeling a panic attack, if they're feeling um, any kind of emotion, uh, what they can do in that moment, what they can do on a physical level, what they can do on a psychological level, what they can do on an emotional, spiritual, and personal level, and doing these things as well, filling out this wheel as well, and uh, demonstrating that we too really believe that self-care is important and essential to mental health can be great. So we don't want to make it seem like, um, oh, because you're at risk and you're vulnerable, you have to do this, but other people don't do it. We want to demonstrate this as well. We also want to do, you know, our affirmations, our breathing exercises, um, go for a walk, spend time in nature, whatever it is that works for us. Uh, and here are some things that youth have said to us. Uh, in different Tumblr surveys and things like that about what people should know when interacting with them. Uh, so they say like, my sexuality doesn't define me, I'm still a random teenager, don't make everything about sexuality and gender identity. So we don't wanna make everything about um, someone's gender identity. So if they're you know, having um, an argument with a friend, it might not be about their gender identity. So we wanna hear what they're telling us and not jump in and assume all the time like, oh, it's because you're gender fluid that you're having this fight with your friend or whatnot. Uh, sexuality and gender are spectrums. And also we don't have just one narrative, listen and don't go solely off of someone else's story. So overwhelmingly you say, hear what I'm saying, hear who I am, don't make assumptions that what works for someone else is gonna work for me or that because I'm this, then I'm also gonna be that or that my ideas of who I am in this world are going to match up with anyone else's. And especially when we're thinking about terms. So again, youth are on that forefront of an evolving language. There are new terms all of the time, and that's great. That's really important that youth have access to that validating language. And it's okay that youth know more than we do. They're the experts on this. They're the experts on their identity. They're the experts on their experience. So it's great to say to them, yeah, you know, send some YouTube videos my way. Send me some blogs, send me, you know, send me all that stuff so that I, that I know more about it. Teach me about this. Um, and always ask, you know, what does that term mean to you? What does, you know, what does that mean? What does that look like for you? And language is always contextual. So there may be language that it's okay for their friends to use, but that they don't necessarily want a teacher to use. Um, and also almost every word that has been used by us as the LGBT community respectfully has also been used against us hatefully. So that's another reason why folks are um, always, you know, looking for that term that's going to fit them is because there are so many negative connotations with terms that have been used respectfully. Um, and that's uh, also why we tr try and train so many youth and so many students on LGBTQ competency and provide books and lesson plans so that uh, their peers really know, like, it's not okay, you know, even though lesbian is quote unquote the correct term, it's not okay to yell at a cross. The, the room or to learn more about the gender binary and learn more about um, gender and gender identity. So here are some resources uh, that we have. You can check out our Trevor Project Pinterest boards and we have lots of stuff there, uh, especially I just want to point out the self-care board that is there. There's lots of different resources there on how to have self-care or safety planning. <clears throat> One of the ones that I really like that may or may not work for folks is having something like a self-care box or uh, a safety planning box. And so you put all the things that you, that you like or that you want to have um, for comfort there in the box. And then when you open it up, there's you know, maybe a, a chocolate bar, maybe there's a, a journal, maybe there's um, your favorite DVD um, or you know, your drawing supplies, whatever it is that um, supports you. Or having a playlist for different emotions or things like that can be really supportive. So there's lots of different things there. Breathing exercises, what to do when you're feeling anxiety or when you're feeling depression. And it's really important that we don't say to youth, like, this is the one thing that you can do and it will work every time. Because sometimes you might go through three or four activities that sometimes help and they're not helping today. Um, so maybe you start drawing and you just don't feel like it. You start journaling and it's not working. You call a friend and you don't really feel validated. You call Trevor Project and you, you know, have a good conversation, but you still need more. So then you go for a walk. So it's okay to emphasize to youth that we have a lot of them because sometimes depending on the scenario, one thing may work and one thing may not. 
and it's okay to try one or two things or three or four things um, in that self-care process. And then we also have YA, Young Adult LGBTQ Books, uh, which are books that um, have LGBTQ characters in them who are not just stereotyped or sidekicks, but the story is actually about them. So that's a great resource as well. We also have LGBTQ picture books, which can be great for when the holidays are coming up, you know, if um, a youth wants to come out or talk more to a family member about who they are, this can be a great way to do it. Um, it can also be great for folks who have youth who are in elementary school to provide those to teachers, to provide those to your, um, your youth, or to provide those to other students. There's lots of great ones on there. And then we have educational resources too, which have um, lots of cool videos about identity and understanding identity, as well as uh, all sorts of things that you can recommend to school districts. Um, and just talking about LGBTQYA literature, one of the ones that um, we read this year and were able to meet the author is um, the book called Symptoms of Being Human. It's definitely for much older youth, so uh, 16, 17 and above, but it is a gender fluid team named Riley. Um, there are several chapters that have tough stuff in them. So there is definitely um, a character who knows someone who did complete suicide. There is an incident of sexual violence. So there are a lot of topics in there, but one of the great things about the book is it talks a lot about, um, you know, what are feelings that folks just go through as humans. So a therapist has a line at one point saying, hey, that's, that's a symptom of being human. Like that's an experience that, you know, you're, you're going to have, that you're going to feel these feelings no matter what. And another great thing about the book is that the character is gender fluid and the character sex assigned at birth is never revealed throughout the book. So the character really is um, Riley and the book is written entirely in gender neutral pronouns. Uh, there's also lots of other books that are on there. Um, as resources that can be recommended or that you can even read along with your teen or read yourself or provide to school counselors or provide to all those other people that might potentially be a safer space um, for the youth and just making sure those people are educated. And we also um, always recommend to the Gender Unicorn, which was designed by the Trans Student Educational Resource um, folks. And it's a great way to talk about all of these different layers that come with identity um, and that there's still uh, these other identities as well in terms of sexual orientation and the difference between gender identity and gender presentation, all of that sort of stuff that can be a good resource to recommend. And then of course we have all of our awesome uh, organizations, including Gender Spectrum, which we do recommend almost all of the guides to every time I talk to teachers, every time I talk to um, school districts or school board members or principals, I'm always like, check out Gender Spectrum. They've done all the work for you. All you have to do is print and <laughs> and then implement. And then this is the glbtnearme.org, which is a great way to find those other community-based uh, organizations near you. Just type in your zip code. And we also have the Coming Out as You Guide, uh, which is online. And it emphasizes that aspect of having all of those different elements to yourself by being able to write down hopes and dreams and interests and resources and to really let you think critically about what's going to happen when they come out um, to a certain person. What are the pros? What are the cons? What is the environment? What's going on in their world? And to, to think about that in a problem solving uh, capacity. Also, um, because uh, this is such a high area of risk, these are some resources for folks who are attempt survivors or coping with loss, uh, additional resources. So Suicide Voices of Awareness Education has uh, great resources for folks who have had a friend die by suicide or um, maybe someone they looked up into the media in the media or someone who is a YouTube influencer or someone that they didn't know personally, but knew through an online network or in, in another capacity, uh, that's definitely something to take a look at those resources as well, because that can increase risk. And also the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, uh, their website is there. They also have lots of resources for coping with loss, support groups, and they also have an LGBTQ page as well. So their resources are there. Also, and of course, uh, programming multiple numbers into your phone is, is never a bad idea either. Having lots of 
resources. So at the end of all of our trainings, we do a head, heart, and feet, which is uh, just a personal reflection to think about if there was anything that you learned today or maybe a resource that you didn't know about before that you know about now. Um, heart, something you felt, um, an emotion you had, whether it was hope, whether it was fear, whether it was um, sadness at, you know, the fact that there is so much hostility that our youth still have to face, and feet, an action item that you can take, whether it's uh, programming that number into your phone or having a conversation with the people in your life and with loved ones, uh, talking to a teacher about providing the curriculum in the classroom, whatever it is that is something that you can do uh, today or within the next week or month. And here is all of my information, and you can contact me. Email is best. I do travel around um, to different states providing education for teachers and education for counselors that is a more in-depth um, training. And so if you email me, then I'll be sure to get, be able to get back to you and be able to send you all kinds of PDFs and links and all sorts of good stuff. So if there's anything that we talked about today and you think, oh, I can't I didn't mention this and I, I don't know where to find, uh, that resource, you can always email me and I'd be happy to provide you with a link. And that is, well, I should probably leave that up for just a moment longer in case folks are uh, writing it down. And that is presentation for today. And we're going to go ahead and go into questions. Danielle, thank you so much. That was really, really incredibly helpful. And you covered, uh, in fact, you covered a number of the questions that came up. So that's great too. Uh, but really just wonderful information. So let me ask you a few questions that people came up that didn't get uh, sort of addressed directly in the presentation and let's maybe talk about a couple of those. Um, the first one was, are, this, are the warning signs a little bit different for youth that are 12 and under than for adolescents that are that sort of teens and, and young adults? So when we're thinking about folks who are 12 and under, their way of understanding concepts around mental health and their way around communicating and expressing may be different. So, you know, instead of something being posted online, it may be something that's expressed through pictures, uh, something that they're drawing or talking about. It, and it, it's not necessarily that the, it's a different sign, just the expression may be different. So there may be, um, you know, of course, the increased withdrawal, there can be, you know, a preoccupation with death, drawing a lot of images around death or the concept of death, having a lot of questions around that, which, of course, could be something that is also just a part of development, but it is something to have a conversation about. Um, different things like um, increased acts of anger or aggression can be one as well. So just being aware and, and trying to provide that space to say, you know, what are you feeling? And it probably, it might not come out as, as direct of a way as someone who's older and has the language to say, I'm thinking about killing myself. It may come out in a different way. So looking for those um, more indirect responses. I just want to sleep forever. I just don't want to be here. I just want to be gone. You know, those are things to take really seriously because they might not have the, the language capacity to, to express it the same way someone who's 16 might express it. Okay, great. Thank you. Another question came in from a teacher, and this can be a, a tricky one. I'm, I'm curious how you'd respond to it. So their question was, I'm talking to a student, and I believe that there's warning signs in that student's at risk. I've asked the student whether or not, you know, can we talk to their parent or encouraging them to talk to the parent? And they say, no, they really don't want to. Um, as an educator, what do you do? When, how do you manage the fact that you know, you're concerned about this child and, of course, depending on maybe the age of the child or some of the other warning signs that you're seeing, how do you handle that or how do you suggest a teacher handle that situation with that youth? That's a really, really good question. Um, so for teachers especially, the first thing that you need to do is know what your policies are on your campus because you don't want to be in violation of any of your policies. So talking to uh, someone in administration or counseling and saying, this is happening, I want to be able to do the right thing, I want to know what our school's policies are on this. If nobody knows what the school's policies are, or if the school doesn't have a policy, that's a great opportunity to go to the Trevor Project website and take a look at our model school policy, which is an LGBTQ competent 
suicide prevention policy, which covers things from training to reporting to, you know, essentially what do you do when a child comes to you and expresses these ideas. When it comes to breaking confidentiality um, with a student to talk to their parents, it's um, depending on what your school policy says, it's something that you want to be careful about because you don't know what the student's home life is and you don't know if home is a safe space. Um, you don't want to make the assumption that, oh, if I tell the parent, the parent will then make sure to take the right steps and provide adequate care for the youth because sadly, that might not happen and that might not be the case. Um, definitely have a conversation with the student about, you know, hey, you mentioned that you don't want me to talk to your parents. You know, what, you know what's, what's life like at home? That might be an opportunity to explore some deeper issues about why the youth doesn't want that shared with the parent. Of course, we never want to break confidentiality and talk to parents about things like, um, gender identity, things like sexual orientation, because then we're essentially outing the student and we may be putting them in an unsafe space. So we do wanna make sure that when it comes to gender identity and when it comes to sexual orientation, that we are not revealing things that the student hasn't revealed. Um, and so it's really important to be checking in on those policies and exploring that a little bit more about what's going on there. And of course, your counselor and um, administrative staff will be able to guide you on, on what to do in that case. Of course, supplying the student with lots of resources in the meantime, because if they're not talking to anyone at home and you're about to go on break coming up here, they don't have access to you. Uh, as someone who's supportive, you want to make sure that they're able to call the Trevor Project or the National um, uh, Lifeline or any of these different places or multiple places. We can give them a bunch just in case, you know, they want to call one one day and one the next, you know, and more resources, the better uh, for the student. Great. Thank you. One question came in from a youth himself that said, you know, they're really struggling with gender dysphoria. And that is really being a trigger then for, for them in terms of dealing with a lot of their feelings. And I think we will actually be having a, a program coming up around gender dysphoria because we know it is a huge issue for youth. But I'm curious, you did address a number of issues related to self-care and the self-care wheel. Is there anything else you want to provide this youth uh, as just something to think about or other ways to help them try to find support as maybe they're feeling very up and down as they get triggered around gender dysphoria? Certainly. Yeah, certainly. I mean, definitely, um, if you haven't joined Trevor Space already, you can join Trevor Space. And there's lots of youth on there that can share different things that have worked for them. Of course, something that uh, has worked for someone else might not necessarily work for you. But there are also lots of different um, links that you can go to or even just, you know, typing in into Google and exploring a little bit. There's tons of different YouTube videos and tumblers and lots of different folks who are saying, hey, here's 10 ideas ideas that work for me sometimes, um, go ahead and try some of them, see what works for you. And don't get discouraged if, you know, you try a couple that work for someone else and they don't work for you, that's okay. You, you're kind of exploring and finding what does work best for you, just like with any kind of self-care. And some may work some days and other days, it just, you know, it's not, it's not doing it for you. So having a lot of them is a really good, you know, having kind of a list, having that little box, having, you know, various things that remind you, okay, I'm in this moment, I'm experiencing this, this feeling. Um, what are some of the things that I can try? What are some of the, the resources I can reach out to? Or even things as small as, you know, a lot of folks will report, even, you know, if you don't feel comfortable expressing one way at school, even doing smaller things like uh, painting toenails or fingernails, cutting and dyeing hair, um, temporary tattoos or drawing on your, you know, drawing little things on yourself in various places can be coping mechanisms as well. Um, also, you know, there's also a, other different things that folks can do, like wearing something underneath your clothing. There's lots of, um, people who have posted all sorts of things that have worked for them. So I would definitely say explore those and see which ones work for you. Great. Thank you. I've got two more questions, Anya. One of them is um, a, a parent was asking about anxiety, sort of signs that, 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 that some of what they're, sh they're seeing in their child is more symptoms of anxiety than depression, but also seems mm -hmm. to be sort of really 
connected to how they're feeling about themselves in a sense of hopelessness. And I'm wondering, uh, you know, is, is that another thing? We sort of all have a, a sort of an idea in our mind about what depression looks like. Um, yeah. But if it, it, is it showing up as anxiety, also something to be concerned about? Yes, yeah. So if it's showing up as anxiety, irritability, anger, uh, combined with things like isolation, certainly. Um, and definitely take a look at the Trevor Support Center. There's a mental health tab that has all sorts of links, especially that are designed for youth as well. So it's things like um, that are designed to like a youth guide to anxiety and we'll have specific coping mechanisms and descriptions about, hey, this is what's going on. Um, you're not the only one that feels this way. Uh, and that can sometimes start to help make people feel better to be able to name what's going on with them, to be able to go, okay, this is, this is a thing, this is a real thing, and here are some of the things that I can do. But yeah, certainly um, things that come out as expressions of anxiety or um, you know, panic attacks, um, especially if school and community are not a safe space, you know, and having anxiety attacks or having um, or having panic attacks or anxiety before going to school, or even things like in young children expressing chronic um, stomach aches or headaches can also be a sign. So something that's more physical in the body rather than verbalized or, you know, mental and uh, like a thought, those are things that we definitely want to take a look at too, because those can be symptoms of anxiety as well, or symptoms of depression or symptoms of other things that are happening, body aches and things that are more physical rather than mental. It's really, really important. We certainly certainly see that a lot when, in working with our youth and families. So I think thanks for addressing that. And the last question is a really good one in that uh, often with mental health kinds of issues, there are differences in how it's expressed based on the gender of the person. Uh, do you see those differences in, in dealing with uh, transgender, non-binary, and otherwise sort of gender expansive youth in terms of the gender, their gender sort of symptoms or signs might look a little bit differently? Uh, based on the gender of the person. Mm -hmm, certainly, yes. So in our culture, especially the idea of that, you know, boys don't cry, men don't cry. Um, they don't, ex they don't have feelings or they don't express those feelings or it's not okay to ask for help or, you know, toughen up or pull yourself up by the bootstraps um, are certainly things that are taught to our youth and they're things to be really aware of if they're part of our family culture as well if that's the kind of mentality we have regardless of what gender person or parent we are we might also have that mentality of like you know we don't we don't cry or um, we don't we don't back down or we always fight or we don't we're, this is who we are in the world um, and I would really recommend personally this is um, a, a personal resource that I really like is Brene Brown uh, is a researcher who does things around shame and around vulnerability, and she has great posts, great videos, great podcasts, great books. <laughs> I've read them all. Um, and she talks specifically about the the gendered ideas around emotion and who's allowed to be vulnerable and who's not allowed to be vulnerable and how that affects folks. There's also lots of campaigns going around because uh, especially for folks who are um, veterans and folks who are um, men of a certain age are at risk for suicidality or su thoughts of suicide as well. So there, there is um, an increased risk of not sharing your feelings and not having that outlet that can be, happen with folks who are, you know, masculine identified or um, feel like, oh, if I, if I do cry, then I'm, then I'm not as, you know, masculine as, as I want to be or want to be seen. So that's definitely, Bernie Brown has some great resources. There's um, other resources that are specific to, you know, providing therapy, especially to boys and men and opening up that conversation. Um, but I think it really, too, it can be, we can have that mentality even as families. And Brene Brown has that conversation about how her family was like, no, this is who we are. Um, she talks a lot about being from Texas. We're Texans and we pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and this is our identity and this is what we do. And being able to um, rise above that or beyond that, and especially as an academic as well, seeing herself as like a logical person. So certainly there you know, examining how we talk about mental health, examining how we talk about vulnerability, examining what kind of um, purposeful or accidental messages we give about people who are vulnerable or who do ask for help um, is all really, really important. 
to look at. Um, she also has great, a great video that I would recommend as well about the difference between, or I think it's in her TED talk and then it's also been made into a smaller video clip, but it's the difference between empathy and sympathy, which is a great thing to take a look at when you are supporting somebody or having conversations around mental health. And that just difference between sympathy being like, wow, it sounds like that's really hard and that sucks to be you, um, as opposed to empathy being something where you actually get down in that space with that person and feel those emotions with them. You're not, you're not holding those emotions at a distance, which can be so hard when you're dealing with loved ones because you don't want them to be in pain and you don't want them to be suffering and you want to push that away and you want to fix it and you want to get rid of it. And it can be really hard to sit with someone and be like, let me just be in the pain of what it is to be you in the world and the experiences that you're having right now. And anger can sometimes be a much easier emotion to experience. Anger at the school or at other kids at the school or anger at the community or anger at, you know, the political environment, anger at all of these things. Um, but we want to make sure we also create that space for vulnerability, for sadness, for, you know, experiencing all of those other emotions that often in our culture are considering, you know, weak emotions. Um, and really talking about the strength that it takes to be able to be vulnerable. So I would recommend those books just because I like them, but there are lots of uh, other resources out there as well about um, vulnerability and specifically vulnerability in men, boys, and masculine identified people. And it might come out as anger instead. Um, if you can't cry, then you get mad. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. One, one of the things I too, too that I think is helpful for parents to be reminded about is that a lot of times fear shows up as anger. And so if they're finding mm -hmm. themselves feeling angry, that what they really yeah. need to do is take some time and see if, if under, underneath all that, what they're really having is a lot of fear about maybe what's going on for their child or, or an adult mm -hmm. or anyone who feels, uh, again, is a, it's their responsibility to help protect that child. And, and <laughs> so it's very difficult to do and when you're not quite sure what to do. Yeah. Well, so certainly in the mentality of like, I'm going to reject you before you can reject me can be a very protective um, coping mechanism to say, you know, I'm just going to be mad at you and assume that you're not going to understand or get you away from me or out of my life or not talk to you about these things. But underneath that is the deep, deep fear that you are not going to understand, that you're going to reject, that you're going to make light of or fun of or, you know, whatever it is that I'm going through. And so I'm just going to reject you first. So that anger and that isolation and that pushing away can also be that symptoms of I'm going to reject you before you can reject me and a great way to, to you know kind of um, open that space up is to do some you know do some research on your own you know be caught reading that YA book you know be caught reading that parent guide be caught being like you know whenever you're ready I am ready to talk about it I am I'm doing my work um, and doing my research and you know yeah that can be so a great important. a great resource well, Danielle, thank you so much for making time today to, to talk with us about this really important topic and for answering questions. Um, just a reminder again that Danielle uh, provided information um, to contact and, and reach you directly. Uh, if somebody needs that after this, feel free to also send us a note and we'll, we'll make sure that you get that information about how to contact Danielle. Um, also put in uh, a suggestion to many people to connect with uh, the Gender Spectrum Lounge for community, um, for parents to connect with other parents and for youth to talk uh, with other youth as well as some other programming. And I think we'll have some of that on our website as well. So Danielle, thank you so much. Thanks for putting up with my froggy voice today as well. Um, but just the work you do is so critically important. Thanks for sharing your expertise with us here today. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you so much for having me. Um, take care. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us.